this, in this new season. Um, but uh, before I do, I want to take a moment to share with you. I want to ask you to share your name and where you're joining from in the comments. You know, I, I, it's important to me that I hear from you. I like to see your names. I try to memorize them. To those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to the Fire Drill Fridays family where we're building community, which is so important. This is not a time for individualism. We're going to be learning about the climate crisis. We're going to be taking action to address it. And you can find ways to get involved at firedrillfridays.com slash take action. And now back to what Fire Drill Fridays is up to um, this season. After nearly three years of being online during the pandemic, Fire Drill Fridays finally got back to being in the streets with a big rally in D.C. this past December, it was fabulous. And now we're headed from the, from the halls of power to the front lines of the climate crisis to bear witness, uplift stories, and stand shoulder to shoulder in solidarity and action with local communities who are rising up. In a few weeks, I'm, I'm going to be going to Texas and Louisiana to learn about the biggest climate bomb in the United States and interview the people that are fighting back against greedy oil and gas CEOs that are, I swear, hell bent on setting off that climate bomb. I'm going to visit West Texas, ground zero of what's called the Permian Basin, an area that now produces more oil than Iraq and is home to the single most extractive oil field in the entire world. I bet you didn't know that. And the scary thing is oil and gas CEOs are pushing for even more extraction. Oil and gas production in the area is projected to increase, get this, by another 50% by 2030. That's exactly by when scientists are telling us we have to cut our emissions by 50%. This is a catastrophe waiting to happen in the Gulf. If unchecked, this American climate bomb would make it impossible for the U.S. and the world to meet our climate goals. It's a weapon against humanity, and it's time we act like it. So from the Permian Basin, I'm going to follow oil to try to figure out how we can stop this thing, okay? I'm going to go to the Gulf of Texas and Louisiana where it's refined, where the oil is exported, exported. This is all for export, by the way, and turned into uh, wasteful plastics, like we need more plastics, right? I'm going to visit people in what's called Cancer Alley where toxic pollution from nearby plants is causing people to get sick and die. I'll go to local fishing communities whose livelihood and ecosystems are being destroyed to pave the way for giant oil export terminals. I'm gonna talk with families that have been hit hard by climate fuel storms and who've come together to rebuild. And all along the way, I'll hear stories from the most inspiring people who are leading the fight against oil and gas expansion that endangers us all. You're gonna really get an up close and personal sense, feeling, and, and I hope empathy for, for these frontline communities. The trip is gonna be the learning of a lifetime for me and I hope for you and I, I'll invite you to be part of it. We're gonna make five 15 minute documentaries of what it is that I'm going to be seeing, because we want to be sure that everybody all over the country knows about this. So be sure to follow Fire Drill Fridays on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to get live, real, raw updates from the road. And as we travel, we're going to be filming, as I said. We're going to be telling the stories of, of the people in the so-called sacrifice zones who were fighting to save their communities, as, as well as ours, from America's biggest climate bomb. Sign up at firedrillfridays.com to be the first to hear when it comes out, this uh, series of documentaries. Now, today, I'm, I'm speaking with two of the incredible leaders that I'm going to be visiting on my travels. They'll give us a little window into the scale of the challenges and tell us about some of the inspiring initiatives that we can all support no matter where we live. First, we have Miguel Escoto a young climate activist based in El Paso, Texas. 
As the Texas lead organizer with Earthworks, Miguel Documents Pollution conducts field work and organizes at the West Texas oil fields. He also volunteers with Sunrise El Paso, a group of young people running an ambitious initiative to transition his hometown away from fossil fuels. Welcome, Miguel. I'm so glad you're, you're joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Jane. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about this. Um, it's really important that these be household names, right? Permian Basin, Cancer Alley. So we really appreciate your amplifying this perspective. So let's start off with you telling us um, about the what in New Mexico and Texas is called the Permian Basin. What is the Permian Basin? Why do you think people should know about it and care about it? The, very simply, the Permian Basin is the number one source of greenhouse emissions in the world. Just with that, we should care about it, right? Um, and so the basin, like you mentioned, it's an oil field that spans from West Texas to Southeast New Mexico. Uh, and yeah, it's one of the worst oil fields for the climate ever. And um, directly on the ground, the oil field harms communities um, who live and work in this extraction zone, the sacrifice zone, um, which in the context of the Permian is a lot of Latino families. Yeah. Um, but even, even if you don't live in this area, even if you zoom out, you, wherever you are, you are affected by the Permian Basin because of what it does across the world. So um, I, I can frame this in, in two different ways. It's the amount of pollution and the amount of production that comes from the Permian. So uh, the Permian directly pollutes the atmosphere. It, um, according to a study by Climate Trace um, map, it ranks the Texas Permian as the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. It gets even worse. That that's only the Texas Permian. If you combine the Texas Permian and the New Mexico Permian, the extreme amount of emissions are double that of the second place ranked, which is an oil field in Russia. Uh, and so, at Earthworks, we've been documenting oil and gas emissions for years. Uh, personally, I've conducted uh, field work in the Permian um, with Sharon Wilson uh, regularly since uh, the summer of 2020. So we use this optical gas imaging camera to visualize what were otherwise invisible pollution, right? Because we can't see methane, um, but it sure does have an impact on, on the environment. And so the most important conclusion that we get from this is that currently you cannot produce oil and gas without emitting methane, without emitting emissions, right? So it's, it's simple math. The more oil and gas you produce, the more methane there will be in the atmosphere. It's that simple. Regulators like to complicate it. Oil and gas companies like to complicate it, but it's that simple, really. You produce, you pollute, and we need to stop production. Production is its own problem with the Permian. It is around 40% of US oil, if you can believe that. It comes from this oil field. Uh, and it produces, if you can try to wrap your head around this, 5.5 million barrels of oil per day. So every day, 5.5 million are just being pumped out of there. For context, um, all of Iraq, it's their their number is four million barrels of oil. So just this oil field surpasses most of what entire countries can do. And a, a very disappointing fact is that this number is higher right now during the Biden administration than it ever was during Trump's. So Biden is beating Trump in oil production in 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 the Permian, and um, yeah, like you mentioned er earlier, Jane, uh, this is expected to double. It's expected to get near 10 million barrels of oil per day by 2030. So this science is telling us we need to stop new drilling and new expansion. The Permian is going the opposite way. And you know it's shocking with all the talk of energy security, and as a that's a justification to keep drilling. Right. right. So much of of what is being extracted is actually headed overseas, right? At at a huge cost to our community. Um, what kinds of impacts is the oil and gas industry causing along the way? Well, um, 
the way I like to think of it is like air, water, and the economy. So in, in this area of the Permian Basin, uh, when, you, when you produce oil and gas, it's not only um, climate pollutants that are emitted, there's also volatile organic compounds, which are very harmful to our health. Uh, they're very harmful. Um, some of them are cause cancer, cause hurt, hurt our respiratory system. So the air in the Permian is filled with cancer. It is filled with extreme amount of dangerous VOCs. Just in this area of Midland and Odessa with a population of around 350,000, there is more volatile organic pollution here than all of Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston combined, of which the population is 10 million. So there's just an extreme amount of, of air pollution going on there. Um, the other aspect is water. So the Permian is a desert region where water should be preserved, right? But unfortunately, uh, fossil it's being wasted for fossil fuel profits. The, the process of fracking is very water hungry. So it pollutes the, water, the local water sources regionally and it drains the, the region of water sources. Mm -hmm. Another part is what the economy does to the people in, the, in, the, in this region, right? So um, the extraction economy dominates most people's livelihoods. In the region, through no fault of their own, um, people work where there is opportunity to make a living and take care of their families, right? And um, this has been the case for two of my uncles and my grandpa. As a region, we basically don't have a choice. If you are a young man without the resources to drown yourself in student debt for higher education, you are economically, culturally, socially forced to work as as a roughneck right as an oil as an oil worker drilling wells transporting radioactive waste fracking and we're basically under a hostage hostage situation because um working in the oil fields is one of the most dangerous professions ever i, I mean from the year 2008 to 2017 um over a thousand uh 500 workers died extracting oil and gas wow that that is more than U.S. troops that died in Afghanistan during that period. So it's it's a war zone. It's ground zero, and uh, we're being poisoned. We're being killed, and for all for short term profits. Wow. But the worst of this is that we we never voted for this. Right? This has been imposed by corporations and and the U.S. government. It's just it's it's heartbreaking and maddening. I had no idea about the deaths of the oil workers. Wow. Miguel, can this reckless expansion be stopped? Can it be stopped? And and if so, how do you think how do you think we're going to stop it? It can be stopped, and we don't really have a choice, right? We we have to do it. Uh, yeah. And in in, in the in the in the long term, you know, our climate movement has to gain enough power at local, state, and federal governments, right, uh, to leverage strength leverage strength over the industry. But we're not exactly there yet we have to build to that but in the short term that's no excuse for what we can do right now in the short term mm -hmm. um which a lot of it could be a climate emergency which president biden can do that's why we he's in office that's why millions of young people voted for him uh because uh we want a livable future um and legally biden can declare a climate emergency which expands his powers he can uh reinstate a crude oil export ban, which basically stops exports. Um, he can deny permits to big fossil fuel infrastructure projects and divert subsidy money away from oil and gas and towards renewables. Biden can do all of this without, con without independent of congressional um, gridlock, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's up to us to pressure him to do that, to do something big and ambitious. Well, we're going to be talking a lot more about exports in the coming months and how we can pressure President Biden to stop oil and gas exports now. This is a critical part of the larger strategy to, to defuse the climate bomb. Um, but I also want to hear about what you're doing on a local level to shift away from fossil fuels, because it's really inspiring. Right. So uh, in, in my hometown community of El Paso, we have... Um, 
we're one of the communities affected by the Permian Basin, right? Um, the current situation here ex exemplifies a lot of the dynamics of interest that really the, the entire um, nationwide climate movement should pay attention to, including control over our electric grids and um, the possibility of local campaigns to win against big national, even international oil giants. It's happening here through uh, the creation of the Climate Charter. Uh, the Climate Charter is a grassroots driven policy project to build power against massive fossil fuel companies in the region, in the Permian Basin, in El Paso. And um, if we can, I, I can dive into a little bit of the story of how we got here, right? So um, as we, we've, we've discussed that oil and gas infrastructure, it's pollution, it's not limited to its destruction on in, in, in the site, right? In the well site, in the oil fields, it uh, affects the entire region all the way to the Gulf. It floods the market, floods the entire world with, with oil, which makes it difficult for other countries to reach their climate goals. Um, El Paso is one of those examples. So, so we're a border community over 80% Latino that's named nicknamed the Sun City. We're the 10th sunniest city in the entire world. Um, you'd think because of that, we'd be leading the country with clean, renewable energy, uh, right? Makes sense. We're the Sun City. We have this extreme potential. That's not the case, however. The private company which controls our electric grid, the El Paso Electric Company, uses five only 5% 5 renewable energy in our grid. And the majority of, of our electricity comes from fracked gas from the Permian. So, so this, this corporation operates three major gas plants, which emits tons of carbon dioxide. Additionally, there's a massive refinery in the middle of the, of the city. Um, and, and we're suffering, but but why, how does this make sense? The, re the reason is the Permian. The reason is this extreme amount of production. So uh, this company has connected our infrastructure through dangerous pipelines to the Permian Basin. And now this low income um, majority Spanish speaking communities that are next to these gas plants have to deal with uh, this extreme level of, of pollution. And so this caught the attention of JP Morgan Chase, a bank notorious for, for financing the fossil fuel industry all around the world. They finance uh, a big portion of um, Permian Basin fracking operations. And in 2019, the bank purchased our electric grid. You heard it right. They the, This bank used legal loopholes to control our electricity. And they want to create the setup where they both profit from extracting fracked gas from the ground, as well as purchasing that gas for electricity at the expense of our health. And so at this time, uh, this group I'm a part of, the, the Sunrise Movement Hub locally, Sunrise El Paso, we fought heavily to prevent this from happening. We processed the city council, we, we held community forums, we canvassed neighborhoods. Um, and it was actually pretty impressive because we, you have this, this passionate group of climate activists in their late 20s, early 20s, uh, late teens, early 20s, we're talking about a, like very complex fi uh, financial concepts like private equity firms, right? And vertical integration. Why? Because we care about what this will mean to our community. And so we warned our community, we warned our, we warned our local government. We don't trust um, this buyout because it will lead to further fossil fuel extraction. Unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. Uh, one of the first things the, the corporation took once they owned El Paso Electric was to propose a new gas plant. This would have been a, a, one point, uh, a $160 million project for new generation, new fossil fuels, new capacity, which is going the wrong way, right? And we, we, we our, our local movement, um, our youth activists, we geared up for battle once again. We fought on many different levels, um, but one that did stick is uh, through our state, through state agencies. We organized with the directly impacted frontline communities that live a mile away from the gas plants. 
These are families who have been living under this gas plant for decades. The local doctors there warn residents about the, the increasing levels of, of respiratory illness that those are caused by the gas plant. So people know that they're being poisoned. One of the families that we worked with, they can see the gas plant that would be expanded just outside their bedroom window, right? Yeah. And so we we helped we helped and we organized uh, with the frontline community members. Eventually, we got a um, lawsuit. We got an environmental justice lawsuit. And even though in the state of Texas, it's very difficult for you to win anything, we got some concessions. One of those concessions was um, that the the company gave this community um, a few thousand dollars for health and environmental projects. They could have, the community could have built a park, called it a day, right? But they decided to keep fighting, to keep fighting and win more power against the, the, this fossil fuel giant. So what happened was um, this concession money from this corporation was used as a fi financial foundation for a brand new experimental powerful climate justice program, which is the climate charter. And so um, in collaboration with this frontline group, with movement lawyers, um, our hub drafted from scratch an entirely new thing, um, an entirely new climate justice program based on the lessons that we learned from previous fights, based on our understanding of the Permian Basin, our understanding of how um, low capital is controlling our local city government, right? Is, is this a ballot measure? It is a ballot measure, yes. It, it's it's something that's actually pretty empowering for, for a community to, to be told, to be asked direct, directly, do you want this or not? Instead of relying on a politician to mm -hmm. lead us on, right? And so um, it's a ballot initiative. Uh, we had to get 40,000 signatures of El Pasoans in support right. of this. And so this was a just even even this, even if I stop the story here, it should be incredibly empowering because we had an example of communities deciding for themselves, yeah. speaking very clearly that ambitious climate activism is popular. If you just put it up to a vote, people really want it. Let's and, hope. Yeah, right. I mean, you're, the, having, a, you're having a rally down there. Right. To, right. Exactly. We're, we're how, can, having... how can people like the people that are listening today, how can people take take action to help what you're doing? I know that I'm going to be there and we'll film that so people can see. But what can people do? Absolutely. Well, we're going to need all the help we can get. Um, the best way we can anyone across the country can help is to donate whatever money they can um, and to sign up for phone banking anywhere, anyone across the country can sign up to phone bank, um, and help talk to El Pasoans directly about this climate charter, which is, re it's really this new thing. It would create a entirely new, uh, climate department within the city, um, that would increase renewable energy. It would reduce pollution, conserve our water, actually make it illegal for, um, our city water to be used for fracking in the oil fields, which is hugely Im impactful. Um, and illegal. Then, yeah, it would make it illegal. It would. It. it we would tell. We would tell uh, corporations, you can't use our water for fracking. You can't use our water for fossil fuels. Yeah. We want that for generative purposes, right? So good, Miguel, what you're doing. I'm just, I'm so excited about this effort. And I'm, I really look forward to taking action together when I'm in El Paso in early April. And um, absolutely, I hope that all you firefighters out there are going to pitch in however you can from wherever you are. Um, we will, on Fire Drill Friday's website, we'll let you know how to send money, where to send it to. And if, if you live in the area, come and join us and we'll let you know when that's going to happen. Yes, Thank you, Miguel. And really, really quickly, that you can find all that also in, in our website. It's www.elpasoclimate.org slash join. It's all there. Could you we, repeat that one more time? Yes. www.elpasoclimate.org slash join. Great. Anyone can help with this. And thank you so much. If you have anybody listening, if you have a question for Miguel, please put it in the chat or comments. 
because uh, we're going to have time for audience questions at, at the end. OK, um, thanks, Miguel. But first, I'm, I'm really thrilled to introduce our next guest, who is a longtime friend. It's all relative. <laughs> I'm 85, so he's not. I've known him for a while and returning guest. He's been here. He was here early on when we were in D.C. on the Fire Drill Friday show. Socket Sony. Welcome, Socket. He's a labor organizer, just an incredible organizer and the author of The Great Escape, The True Story of Forced Labor and Immigrant Dreams in America. It is a brilliant book. He is the founder and director of Resilience Force, a national nonprofit that advocates for the rising workforce that rebuilds after climate disasters. Hi, Socket. Hi, Jane. So great to be back with you on Fire Drill Fridays. And I'm so excited for your upcoming trip to the Gulf Coast. Yeah, me too. Listen, we've we've talked about America's largest climate bomb spanning West Texas and New Mexico. We've talked about where that oil and gas is headed, exports, and uh, the impacts on communities it's having along the way. But I also want to talk about the impacts on the other side of this equation. You know, we, we know more fossil fuels equals worsening climate disasters. And can you tell us about the reality of how that's all showing up in the Gulf? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, Miguel did such an amazing job of giving this picture of um, what's causing the problem, right? Um, the extraordinary level of emissions from this region uh, in the United States and the world. Um, I represent all of the workers who rebuild homes and schools and cities after climate disasters, after hurricanes and floods and fires. And so um, as, as I've led Resilience Force, my, my members and I have had this front row seat to how um, uh, all of the problems are showing up uh, that are caused by the emissions that uh, Miguel was talking about. And it's very, um, and it's very disturbing, um, Jane, and it's very, very vivid. You know, um, Hurricane Katrina and the flooding after Hurricane Katrina which was in 2006, um, which really shaped the Gulf Coast. Um, that was supposed to have been a hundred, a hundred year flood, a once in a hundred year event, right? Since then, we have seen over $200 billion disasters, over 200 disasters that have caused a billion dollars of damage or more. Um, and because of the rising heat um, in the atmosphere, the warming of the waters, these disasters are becoming more frequent. They're also becoming more destructive, more frequent, more forceful, more destructive. Um, and you can see it now in the way that hurricanes hit. Um, you know, um, Hurricane Laura, which hit Louisiana a few years ago, uh, came to New Orleans, came to uh, Louisiana, um, not quite New Orleans, but came to Louisiana, um, but then, you know, turned uh, it didn't just hit Louisiana. It turned and it became a tropical um, rainfall that went to Brooklyn and flooded basements in Brooklyn. It then went to Pennsylvania and flooded pub pu public schools in Pennsylvania. This is the same event, you know, the same event that is now uniting people across the country because of its impacts. Um, Hurricane Ian, which hit Florida uh, last year, you know, um, Meteorologists, uh, uh, meteorologists are, have said that um, these hurricanes sit uh, above the cities for longer and longer as they wreak their havoc and destruction. And I speak to, you know, residents all the time who've lost their homes, whose whose roofs have blown, um, who tell me that in their lifetimes they've never seen anything like the last 10 years, you know, they've gone through lots and lots of disasters, but to see tornadoes spin off from hurricanes and to see these hurricanes sit on top of cities um, for, for um, not for hours, but for days sometimes, um, you know, that's new. But I think Jane, the other thing that's happening as a result is really where we all come in as organizers, you know, where you and Miguel and I, but also all the firefighters on this call, um, which is that as a result of 
um, how these disasters are changing as a result of how these disasters are becoming more frequent and more destructive, we now have an opening to talk to hundreds of thousands of people in this region about climate change. People who never agreed with us before, well, they may still not agree that carbon emissions are causing climate change, but they definitely agree that they need their basements dry, they need their homes rebuilt, and, and they need their schools and cities to be safe. Mayors definitely agree that they need their tax base to stay in place. So I think there's also a new opening to build the majority we need because yeah. of uh, the new nature of these of these climate disasters. So tell us about Resilience Force. What, what is it and how did it come about? Sure, yeah. Resilience Force really came about because of the workers who rebuilt New Orleans and the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina. Um, I was a labor organizer um, after Katrina. I had actually come uh, to New Orleans to be a relief worker for 10 days. And I ended up staying 16 years building um, this organization to protect the workers doing the rebuilding. My days would actually start, Jane, uh, under a uh, at 5.30 in the morning under a 60-foot tall monument to Robert E. Lee after Katrina. And that had turned into this hiring hub where mostly black and brown workers were standing there waiting for jobs to rebuild the region. Well, as more and more um, hurricanes came, those same workers who helped build New Orleans after Katrina um, helped rebuild many, many cities um, they'd go to Houston to build after Hurricane Harvey. They went to North Carolina, to Florida, and they'd always call me. They'd say, you'd never believe where we are. Um, these workers, as the years went by, uh, worked six, seven, then 10, then 20 hurricanes. So what you have now is this completely new American workforce that's emerged of migrant transient workers and Jane, the interesting thing is many of these workers are actually from Honduras and Guatemala. Many of them have actually come to the United States as climate refugees. You know, many of them are in the U.S. They've crossed the border. They're here. They sought refuge because um, climate disasters based on U.S. emissions, yeah. you know, have destroyed their homes in Honduras and, and, and Salvador and Guatemala. So, so all these immigrant workers are here. Um, and they're rebuilding, they've become the white blood cells of America's recovery after hurricanes, floods, and fires. They follow disasters, and my organization and I, my team at Resilience Force, follows the workers. We protect them, but we also try to uh, build relationships between them and the residents that they're helping um, to build a kind of new political awareness that all these issues are connected. You know, immigration, climate, these are all connected. We're all going to become immigrants because of the climate crisis if we I don't fix it. I remember when you, when you first appeared on Fire Drill Fridays um, uh, three and a half years ago, and you, you mentioned um, part of your resilience workforce was working in the panhandle of Florida. And one home that had had its roof blown off had a sign on the door, immigrants will be shot. That's right. That's that, that that sign. You know, they were so afraid. I mean, this was a family. My heart went out to them. Uh, this was a, an older family. Their roof had blown away. Their house was barely standing. And they put up a sign in the dark, no electricity for miles around. All they had was their own resources. And they put up this sign that said, strangers will be shot. Well, we showed up to their door, a group of strangers, Resilience Force and its members. And... Um, you know, we said, well, we're strangers and we would like to rebuild your home. We did. We rebuilt their home and afterwards we had dinner with them. We supplied interpreters. They had this profound conversation uh, about the climate with laborers from Honduras and Guatemala. Um, and they took and, the sign and, down, right? And they took the sign down. They took that sign down. And that's, I think, a story of hope in the climate crisis. Totally. Now, you have a book that I've already mentioned, The Great Escape, a true story about forced labor and immigrant dreams in America. It's just, it's so good. I couldn't put it down. Tell us, tell us more about the story. Well, thank you so much for reading, Jane. Yes, the book is um, The Great Escape, a true story of um, forced labor and immigrant dreams in America. And it's actually one of the stories 
um, that played out as I started my work in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Um, as I was um, in New Orleans, one night I got a mysterious midnight phone call from a worker um, who turned out to be from India. And I was thinking, what on earth is a just arrived worker? I'm from India, I'm from New Delhi, India. And we spoke in Hindi. And um, I wondered what on earth is this man doing just arrived from India to work in the ruins of the Mississippi Gulf Coast where Katrina made landfall. Well, it turned out he was one of 500 workers from India uh, brought by a Mississippi oil rig builder to repair oil rigs and, and build new ones, a fossil fuel company, you know, trying to enrich itself after Katrina. Uh, by maneuvering for contracts, um, had sent recruiters to India and brought these workers to America. The workers had been promised green cards, the chance to bring their families. The catch was they had to pay $20,000. So they sold their ancestral homes. They took huge debts. They came to Mississippi and Texas. Um, and it turned out they had promised, they'd been promised an American dream and they'd been dropped into an American nightmare. There were no green cards. They were living in labor camps on company property, working round the clock shifts for this fossil fuel industry leader. Um, they were um, living behind barbed wire fences, um, 24 to a trailer. Um, and all they were eating was frozen rice. They were given frozen rice that they would suck on uh, to warm up for nutrition. So the book is about how I met them and how we engineered together uh, a kind of uh, heist film style, Great Escape. And I don't want to give anything away, but it involved uh, lots of wild turkey, whiskey, and flavored cigars as uh, bribes to the security guards that this company had guarding its workforce. Um, and the pretext of a uh, of an Indian wedding, an elaborate Indian wedding, which was completely fictitious, which allowed us to ferry the workers out from under the noses of um, of the of the security guards to build this to bring this fossil fuel company to justice. So so great in your <laughs> mind, Socket. How how is the story of these uh, workers connected to the you know bigger picture of fossil fuel expansion and and the climate emergency? Yeah, it's really it's really a, a part of the story that that you and Miguel were just telling, you know, these companies um, that don't feel responsible to communities that don't feel connected to our destiny as, um, you know, as a planet um, and don't have a responsibility to future generations. Um, they're trying to make money. And in this case, here you have a fossil fuel company that was positioning right as they brought in this work, this workforce, you know, this company was positioning to be a leader in Gulf Coast oil rig building. Um, they were um, owned by a private equity firm and just positioning to go public, you know, uh, expanding its, uh, its profits, you know, tenfold. Um, and, and the way they were doing that was by increasing production, right? But how were they increasing production? You know, so much of the propaganda of these companies is that they're creating local jobs. We need them for jobs, right? But they weren't creating local jobs. They could have been hiring workers in Mississippi and Texas. At the time, by the way, those workers were just returning home from having been displaced after Hurricane Katrina. They needed those jobs. But instead, what did this company do? They sent recruiters to India to bring workers in under a, a scheme that a federal jury would later find to be human trafficking. And the company brought in um, the most skilled workforce in the world at a fraction of the cost of American workers. So I, I think some of the moral here um, is that we really have to investigate. I mean, if these companies are doing what they're doing to the planet, they sure must be doing the same thing to workers. And we really need to get behind, uh, beneath the propaganda that these are good American jobs. In fact, the place new American jobs are gonna come from is from resilience, from making our climate uh, and our cities adaptive to the climate change we know is coming. That's really gonna produce jobs. That's already producing jobs. Those are really green jobs. Um, so I, I think the story is really part of a bigger, a bigger climate story. Um, the bigger climate story you're coming down to tell, 
Jane, um, into the Gulf Coast. I'm so excited to visit you in New Orleans next month. Can give us some juicy details uh, about what you have in store? Oh, God, I can't wait to. I'm so glad you asked. Okay, so first of all, um, you know, you're going to arrive uh, and meet um, some of the extraordinary protagonists of our climate crisis, the protagonists of a hopeful story uh, about so much that can still be done, uh, you know, um, to save our cities, um, our ecosystems, and our world. The people you're going to meet, a lot of them are the immigrant workers who have been rebuilding year after year, hurricane after hurricane. Uh, people who rebuilt New Orleans after Katrina, uh, then went on to build, rebuild Houston, cities in North Carolina. Um, Jane, these are these are extraordinary people. I mean, these are people who, you know, after a hurricane hits, everybody's under so much pressure. Um, people need to come back to their homes. Parents need to put kids back in schools. Mayors need to save their tax bases. Everything depends on the workers. And the workers are these people who have no infrastructure. They're living in their cars. They're sleeping on Home Depot parking lots. They're waking up in the morning and washing themselves with bottles. This is how America has chosen to do climate recovery. It's unconscionable. Um, we at Resilience Force protect them and we're gonna take you in the morning to the Home Depot parking lots um, where these workers gather and, and, and fan out to run the recovery. But then in the afternoon, there's a special treat, which is um, the book, The Great Escape, is a book about immigration, but you know, all immigration stories are love stories. And it's a book about people who really tried to get reunited with their families, separated from their families who were reunited. Well, some of the families of the book are coming to New Orleans. Um, and the book, um, uh, the book actually uh, features a lot of food. Food is a great part of the story of the book. Um, in the labor camps, people were denied their humanity by being denied food. Um, but then as we, as we uh, struggled for justice, a lot of what sustained us was food. And we're going to cook you the recipes from the book. Uh, it's going to be this incredible meal um, that, uh, that, is, that will appear heaven sent, but actually um, expresses so much of the substance and the culture of the people cooking. Uh, it, it'll in, include, uh, you know, dosas, crepes that appear to be like, uh, you know, pillowy, like, like they were made in heaven, um, incredible lentils. Um, and it'll be really a fusion of Gulf Coast and South Indian food um, and a celebration of the stories and the resilience of the workers and their families. So we're, we're just very, very excited to celebrate you and to celebrate the workers who've been rebuilding the Gulf Coast time after time, year after year. Oh God, that is amazing. I can't wait. <laughs> Come hungry is all I'm saying. For sure. And lastly, so, okay, what can our firefighters do out there to be part of, of, of the solution to support a just and dignified climate resilience workforce? You know, the good news is there's so much to do, so much to do. I mean, you heard from Miguel. I mean, Miguel is one of my personal heroes for, 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 for the kind of deep work you're doing, Miguel. I, I would say people should find organizers to support, get behind them. People like Miguel in, in Texas. There's so many people in Cancer, Cancer Alley in Louisiana. Um, there's Resilience Force if you want to support the workers who are rebuilding, um, not only rebuilding homes, but building the possibility of new social cohesion after hurricanes. You know, a lot of what our workers do is um, we rebuild the homes of people who before the hurricane thought they were for fossil fuels and against immigrants. They were for the companies and they wanted to build more oil rigs and more walls, you know. And our members, our workers, as they're rebuilding, they build these bonds with homeowners, you know, and change minds as a result. Of that, so so you know these are the efforts to change politics, change minds. Um, firefighters everywhere can support these local efforts, uh, and I think it also just comes down to conversation. You know, um, in all of our families, there's a breadth of politics and a breadth of 
of interpretation, and we can all be sitting down, bring more and more people to be an audience of these Fire Drill Fridays, because this has become an incredible forum to get really clear about what needs to be done and prepare for our climate future. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Saket. And I can't wait to see you in New Orleans. And it's always so interesting to talk to you. Can't wait. Can't wait. So audience, I, we want your questions now for both Miguel and Saket. So what are your questions? Maddie, you want to give us audience questions? Yeah, we have some great ones rolling in for both of you. Um, so this question is actually for either of you, Miguel or Saket, but from Layla, who's watching on YouTube. How likely do you think it is that big oil companies will actually shut down in the next decade? Is it possible? I'll let you take that one, Miguel, since you're really leading us in so much of that fight. Big question. Um, I think I would change the framing not to say, um, will fossil fuel companies do the right thing? We can change the framing to Will we create enough power to do that? It's not, how can we make a situation? How can we build a movement to where it's not up to them? And it's actually up to the average person, the average working class oil field worker. How can they be the ones in charge to be the ones that shut this down? Uh, and if we think of it that way, if we think of it in terms of it can be our decision instead of their decision as executives in Wall Street, and I think it's very possible and soon. Perfect, thank you. Um, this question again is for either of you, Socket or Miguel, but from Gina on Facebook, who specifically in the Biden administration are approving export projects and how can we influence them? I th are you tracking that? Right. I think a lot of it is the um, the energy, the energy sector, the Secretary of Energy, and um, I think a lot in a lot of these issues, it's it's a lot of the administration is waiting for the Biden, the Biden as the chief executive officer to take action. So in a lot of in a lot of issues, it's multiple agencies and for multiple states. But for them to take action, the orders have to come from above their pay grade, from Biden himself. So yeah, it, it took him out a while for me to answer that because I believe in a lot of the cases, it's different people, different agencies. It's a big, complicated web. But that's part of what industry has done. It's part of what the government does to shy away from their responsibility is say, don't point the finger at this agency. It's that agency. But the book has to stop somewhere. And it's Biden himself. Perfect. Yeah, we were getting a lot of questions like that. I think people are just eager um, to be able to influence someone, uh, influence the decision makers. Yeah, it's um, about Thank you. And um, the next question is for Socket um, from Louisa on YouTube. How much worse is methane than carbon dioxide for our planet? And why is there so much methane in the Permian? Oh, well, um, uh, you know, that should be for Miguel <laughs> is another Miguel question, but I'll just say on the last question, I would say, you know, there's so much amazing work going on right now. Um, Jane is leading incredible work. Um, Annie Leonard at Greenpeace. Um, so many of our leaders in the climate movement have been leading work that um, that, as 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 some put it, uh, work to take away the license of fossil fuel companies to operate. So, so yes, great to focus on the White House and Biden, but but I'm with Jane and 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 just just to say we also need to stop it being permissible and possible for anybody running for any elective office to take money from the fossil fuel companies. We have to create that environment. Thank you, Socket. Right. Absolutely. And, and to answer the the methane one specifically, methane is around 80 times more powerful for warming the climate than carbon dioxide. 
And what we find in the field is oil and gas infrastructure and the process of extracting oil and gas and putting it through pipelines, putting it uh, through gas plants, putting it to export facilities, it's, an, it's a fragile system. And throughout that entire process, methane is released into the atmosphere. And so that's the danger there. If you produce it, if you ship it, if you put it through pipelines, it's going to emit methane, which harms the, the climate. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a question about the El Paso climate rally um, from a couple of people. Um, so pulling Jeff's question from Facebook, when and where exactly is the El Paso climate rally so that we can look for news and try to attend? Yes, um, absolutely. We're very, very excited to have Jane there. We're, we're, we're going to have it Saturday, April 8th. Uh, the details are coming. Uh, we, we can hopefully have this, this um, update that through through this platform and others. Um, but yeah, up, upcoming April 8th. And we'll have the address on uh, on our Fire Drill Fridays website. Incredible. When the time comes, yeah. So exciting. Thank you. Um, so a question, another one for you, Miguel, from David on Twitter. Um, are the methane links you see in the Permian accidental or part of business as usual for oil extraction? Business as usual. It's part of their process. Part of their business model is to release methane. Why? Because if you create the per if you create the perfect engineering miracle of extracting oil and gas from the ground for usage, it doesn't exist. That's living in fantasy land. It costs way too much money. It's you don't make a profit out of it. So part of their business model is to say we are we're going to release part of this. Part of they they have uh, flares. They have uh, release valves. They intentionally have what's called blowdowns in pipeline stations where they know they know that so they that this is just one example. They have to fix part of a pipeline that's shipping gas, right? So in order to fix that pipeline, um, they have to stop the flow of gas going to that area. So what do they, what do they do with all with all of the gas that's going downwind? They just blow it into the atmosphere. They use our sky as a dumping ground, and this is largely permitted by state agencies and the EPA. So it's absolutely part of their business model. Yeah. I think um we're 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 going to have to close it on the on the questions from the audience cuz we're running a little bit out of time um and I want to say a few things at the end that are personal. Socket and Miguel, I appreciate your coming on the show so much and helping us understand why the Gulf region, Louisiana, Texas, and New Mexico, the Permian Basin is ground zero for the climate crisis. Thank you. And I'll see you again in April and, and May. Thank you so much. The science is clear, folks. We cannot invest in any new fossil fuel projects and stay below the global warming target of one and a half degrees Celsius above what the temperature was before the Industrial Revolution, which is when we started burning fossil fuels. We can only get one and a half degrees warmer. We're already partway there. And by doing, by in order to make that happen, we have to cut our emissions in half and we're going in the wrong direction. It's the most country's most expanded oil and gas areas in the whole United States. And so this is what happens in this region is going to have an impact on every single one of us. And the good news is it's not too late. OK, it's not too late. Eighty percent of the projected increase in production is from new wells that haven't been drilled yet. OK, so we can stop it. That means we can stop it and we have to act now. The majority of oil produced in this region is being exported overseas because we can't use it in local markets. To expand drilling, they have to expand expand exports. See, their, their responsibility because they're publicly held companies is to their stockholders, right? So they have to keep doing it in order to be able to make money to to show their stockholders they're a growing company. So they have to expand. And they do that in two ways. They do it 
through exporting. We're going to keep drilling because we have to export. And the other is we're going to keep drilling so we can make single-use plastics. And don't we all know that we need more of that in this world? It's terrible. All kinds of ways we can th throw sand into the gears to slow this thing down, though. And ultimately, we can stop this expansion if we can get President Biden to stop oil and gas exports. This isn't far-fetched. The U.S. had a crude oil export ban for 40 years, right up until Congress repealed it in 2015. Now is the time to fight firefighters. You know the drill to make change. We got to take action. So go to firedrillfridays.com slash take action to tell President Biden to stop oil and gas exports. If we can show that there's a broad united force of people across the country, we can create the necessary pressure on Biden and his administration to stop green lighting export project permits and put an export ban back in place. You know, we're just getting started. Follow us, follow Fire Drill Fridays on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you can join me online as I head to Texas and Louisiana this month to meet people on the front lines and, and learn about more ways that we can stop these things. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I want you to know the next few months are going to look a little different since I'm going to be out in the field, but I'll be sending live updates and there are going to be a lot of opportunities to interact and ask me questions along the ways. And one of the ways that I invite you to participate is by reading and learning with me. So I've decided to start a Fire Drill Friday book club. And on the list, of course, we have Socket Sony. That's S-O-N-I, -S Sony. His book is The Great Escape, a true story about forced labor and immigrant dreams in America. You've heard all about it today. Another book that I highly recommend is Strangers in Their Own Land. Strangers in Their Own Land by Arlie Hochschild. It's the story of a liberal Ber Berkeley-based sociologist and her, her journey deep into the Louisiana Bayou country as an effort to understand the American far right. And along the way, she explores Tea Party culture through the keyhole of environmental pollution. It's just a fascinating read. And um, I think you'll enjoy it a lot. And if you're more of a podcast kind of learner, Boomtown is a, an 11 part uh, podcast show about billionaires who are fueling the oil boom in West Texas and how it's reshaping our climate, economy, and geopolitics. Definitely on topic, don't you think? Find out about these and more at our newly formed firedrillfridays.com slash book club. Sounds like a good name for a movie. Hmm. Read or listen with me and we'll all chat about it down the road, okay? And don't forget to mark your calendars for June when we're going to release the full docu-series of my journey on the front lines of the climate crisis in Texas and Louisiana. It's, it's going to be something special. <clears throat> I found out yesterday um, because I got an email from him. Dan Ellsberg um, only has a few more months to live because he has pancreatic, a very unusual kind of pancreatic cancer. And um, I know that some of you may not know who Dan Ellsberg is. He um, he's a uh, he was a political activist. But mostly he was a former United States military analyst who worked at the Rand Corporation. And in, in 1970, I think it was, no, it was 71, he took the top secret Pentagon papers, um, which was a study of many, many volumes study of U.S. decision making in relation to the Vietnam War across Republican and Democratic administrations. It really told the story of America's involvement in Vietnam. And he took the, this secret document, massive amounts, copied it and turned it over to the New York Times and the Washington Post. And it changed everything. <laughs> um, he was sentenced to 70 some years in jail, prison. 
But when the Watergate controversy started to unfold, um, eventually it was realized that Nixon had committed criminal acts and Dan Ellsberg was pardoned. But his, his, his doing that altered the, the trajectory of the Vietnam War and our involvement in it and made him a true American hero in the most profound sense. I read uh, a good part of the Pentagon Papers um, and I discovered something that during the Johnson administration, he had been um, advised to bomb the earthen dikes of North Vietnam where millions and millions of, North Viet of Vietnamese people lived. The dikes are made of mud by human hands, the hands of the peasants. And Johnson, to his credit, he said, no, we can't do that. America cannot be bombing these dikes. You see, like in, because he said Hitler did that in Holland during the war, bombed the dikes of Holland. Like Holland, North Vietnam is below sea level. <clears throat> But Nixon agreed to do it. And Henry Kissinger had thought that probably if, if Nixon did this, that hundreds of thousands of people would die from famine because it's the breadbasket of North Vietnam um, or flooding, they would drown. And when I read that, I realized how important the dikes of North Vietnam, and it was right before monsoon season when the floods would come. And that's why I went to North Vietnam. So for me, Dan Ellsberg changed my life and I owe him so much. Um, he inspired me and motivated me. And I just wanted all of you to know that we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna soon lose a great man. And we all have to be aware of that. Thank you all for being here today and being part of the Fire Drill, <clears throat> Fire Drill Friday community. I'm, oh gosh, you don't know how excited I am to be out there and to help make a difference together with you. So I'll see you next time. Thanks.